Hello, everyone. So, apparently, I, uh, I'm a Jezebel, and I'm deceived by demons, and uh, I'm lawless. Because I believe in the true gospel of Jesus Christ, that he came here, lived a perfect life, the only one to ever live a perfect life without any sin whatsoever, and gave himself up as a sacrifice for all sins, and that he imputes his righteousness onto us, those who believe, those who trust that he did what he did. That's why I am all those terrible things. I hope you can sense the sarcasm. <laughs> There are actually people out there on YouTube who claim to be Christians and they say that Jesus actually didn't die for all of our sins, just a few, um, that we have to follow the Torah perfectly to be saved, and that the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with us being able to resist sin. So how could they be Christians? It doesn't make any sense. Like. It's basically Judaism with a Jesus stamp of approval on it. I mean, this deception is is growing. Um, they talk all about the Torah. I don't hear much about Jesus. Um, and they use the Hebrew language and um, they kind of have this pride about them, I've noticed. I'm not going to uh, name anyone specifically, even though there is someone that came after me a little bit. But um, this is not necessary. If you know the truth, you'll be able to see who's right and who's wrong. But um, so, so yeah, they kind of criticize us Gentiles, you know, who say Jesus and Holy Spirit and um, God the Father. They, it's very legalistic. They bring in a lot of laws and they say we're lawless because we rely on the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit to um, sanctify us. I don't practice or preach lawlessness. I hate sin, but I don't hate sin to become saved. I hate sin because I'm saved. Do you see what I mean? Once you get saved, the Lord will transform you from the inside out. And that is truth. That's the truth that I've always been taught. And, and that's you know, always going to be the truth. Um, it's not going to change. God doesn't change. If you are saved, then the Holy Spirit won't allow you to feel good in your sin anymore. You can go on living sin, but you're going to have a miserable time doing it. And I know that from experience. Even before I truly understood the scripture, I tried to live in sin and I had a terrible life. It was horrible. And the Lord allowed that because that's what he does with his children. The Lord disciplines his children, and that's in the Bible too. Um, why would he discipline someone that's not his? Do you discipline other people's kids? Um, no, unless you're babysitting, but God's not a babysitter. He disciplines his own. He keeps you on track. He allows the enemy to wreak havoc in your life until you get back on track. Um, but that's out of love. It's not like because he hates you. It's to get you back on the path of righteousness that he establishes for his children. And to say that Jesus went through what he went through for us just for a few sins, that doesn't even make sense. It's insulting to the cross. I mean, they beat him so hard and so violently that you couldn't even recognize him as a man. I mean, the whips ripped his skin off. It's not just like, you know, little stripes. Of course, he had stripes. The Bible talks about his stripes. But the, the weapons they used on him before he even got on the cross were so intense. I mean, and that was just for a few sins. The scripture says he died for all. The sins for all the world. I don't remember anything about specific sins. And if that's the case, then whew. <laughs> We're all going to hell because we are not perfect and there's no way. What they don't understand is that when Jesus came, he raised the bar. Remember when he was talking to the 
people about sin, like adultery, and he's like, uh, you know, Moses said that you shouldn't commit adultery, but I say, this is Jesus speaking, I say that if you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So he brought the knowledge of heart sin, sin on the inside, not just doing things wrong like they knew before, but he raised the bar. Like, there are more sins out there that you don't even know about. Um, in your head, in your mind, your heart, like, that's our nature. When we believe on the sacrifice of Jesus, he gives us his nature. Um, so we don't want that stuff anymore, and we realize when we do something wrong. So and that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's spirit. Um, and he is God. He is part of the God Trinity. So they don't realize how wicked they are. And that's part of being saved. You have to realize how wicked you are, how much you need Jesus as a savior um, to be your advocate. When you stand before God, you need Jesus there to say, she believed on me. She is uh, my righteousness. So God's standard is perfection. If you break one law, you've broken them all. Um, it's like when you're shopping and you're looking through a bunch of products, all the same thing. You want to buy the best one, right? You don't want the one with the crack or the stain. If it's got a stain, it's worthless, right? If it's got a crack, it's worthless. Throw it away. Give it away. You don't want it anymore. That's also God's mentality. He wants you to be perfect. And we can't be perfect unless we receive, not achieve, receive salvation from Jesus. It's all about God's righteousness, not our righteousness. It's all about his grace, not our works. You see what I mean? That's what the, the enemy does. He makes you look on yourself for salvation instead of look upon the cross. For salvation and we're all still in this corruptible flesh if this flesh was incorruptible then what is the Bible talking about when it says that we receive incorruptible bodies at the rapture if we could establish perfection without any spiritual help all on our own why would we need Jesus and to say that the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with this is saying that this is all me all by me and the Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith alone that it's not by our works lest any man should boast the Bible is um, preaches a message that is against pride and against hypocrisy he didn't have a problem with the sinners he had a problem with the self-righteous Pharisees who wouldn't sit with sinners you know they thought that they were too cool for school you know that was the theme with those guys and it's funny because the way I have been treated since standing on the true gospel is much like the way Jesus was treated by the Pharisees. All the things that they say to me, like, oh, you have a demon and you're lawless and all this stuff, they said to Jesus. Um, so that makes me feel like I know the truth. <laughs> Thank God for that. That just, you know, reassures me that I'm on the right track. If people are insulting you the same way they insulted Jesus, you're on the right track. I'm going back and, and seeing things that I didn't understand before that make perfect sense now. Like the book of Romans. No clue what was going on. Because I didn't understand how powerful his grace is. How we need to focus and rely only on his grace rather than ourselves. Because we're hopeless. <laughs> Without his imputed righteousness. And when I say imputed righteousness, I mean... Um, when God looks at us, he doesn't see sin anymore, which is this flesh. This flesh is sin. He sees his son because we have received his son. These people are the ones who will be like, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not perform all these wonderful works? And they'll say, depart from me. I never knew you, you that work iniquity, because they didn't have the imputed righteousness of Christ because they didn't believe in what he did. They didn't believe he did what he did. You know, they didn't believe the gospel. They were basically unbelievers. And there's a scripture that basically says this. I don't know how anyone can argue with it. Um, okay. Here it is. 
Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. God's grace is not good news to the proud who want credit for their salvation. They don't think God's grace is fair. It's just like the story of the prodigal son. And now I know why that story is in the Bible. It teaches us this very scenario. So basically, um, this man had two sons. One was perfect, you know, and followed all the rules and never transgressed the law. And, you know, and the other one went off and lived in sin, went crazy, you know, just totally rebelled until he had nothing left. He was just desperate for help. So when he comes home to his father and his father welcomes him with open arms. He's just so excited that his son came back. That he's not even mad about the way he was living, which is like our father. And then the perfect son, when he saw that going on, was mad. He's like, how can you treat him that way after all he did? I'm the one who was perfect. You know, I'm the better son. You never treated me that great. See, it's the same thing. These people don't like the grace of God. They think it's unfair because they're working so hard to please him, yet the person over there living in sin is still saved. And then the, the Pharisee. Hold on. You have to know this one. Okay, this is Luke 18, starting at verse 10. All right. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed, thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as the other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You see, the one who was humble and, and knew he was a sinner and wouldn't even look up, he was the one who was exalted, not the one who was like, oh, thank you, I'm not like those other men, because we're all sinners. None of us are perfect, even the one who gets everything right but one. Not perfect because of that one thing. And Jesus was the only one who could be perfect. You know, um, our sins have already been paid for. We just have to believe it. That our Savior actually saved us. Um, saving is done. That's why he said it is finished at the cross. It's done. Um, we just have to believe it. So anyway, I just wanted to get that out so you don't be deceived. I'm going to stand on this gospel message until they chop my head off. I don't care. Seriously, this is the most important thing you will ever know. And they're trying to twist it, add to it, and, you know, pervert it. And this is also something the Bible says will happen. False messages, false gospels, accursed gospels. Um, and I know it's crazy to think that these people could be bad because they're preaching righteousness. But the Bible says that Satan's messengers are ministers of righteousness. Um, you can look that up. Just type in Ministers of Righteousness Scripture on Google. It's right there. Um, and, you know, no marvel. It says no marvel because, you know, Satan also transforms into an angel of light. So you have to be careful. Um, and a lot of people want to please the Lord, but they just go about it the wrong way. So, anyway, um, I love you guys. I hope that you have received something from this message, and if you have decided to believe on Christ today, please let me know, because I really want to know. Um, that's like the best thing I could ever hear. So, alright, I love you guys. God bless.